got to put together a sort of a pamphlet for the class, right? I'm going to get together with him and take all my overheads and we'll just make copies of them. We'll put a few blank sheets in there and we'll try to have some kind of pamphlet for you. I've never organized this material. You know, it's only been 15 years, you know, so. And it keeps changing all the time. That's the problem, see. But I need to fix a certain set of overheads and just fix them and operate from there. So I think what I'll do is I'll take advantage of Larry and see if we can't do that. And uh, this is, uh, I'm going to show quite a few of these overheads right, right straight in a row. So you may want to focus in on the overheads for the camera and let's do that because I want to run through some first ones here till we get down to where we want to be today. As you all know, I'm a, I'm a real believer in repetition and I always start off from the very beginning every time. You know, like Genesis 1-1, we studied the Old Testament for, what, six months and every class period we started with Genesis 1-1. And so here, the, the real issue here is how old is the earth? because you cannot have a young earth and have evolution and yet you can't have an old earth and have creationism so you have to make a decision and you can't you can't stand in each place and call yourself a theistic evolutionist or that God used evolution that just won't hack it because what you've done is you've denied the sovereign divine sovereign creator his creative role and things are not old just because they look old. This could be the result of a worldwide flood. It could be the result of a great chaos and everything that has occurred during our creative history. And so it's according to what kind of eye you use and what kind of brain behind the eyes that you use to, to come up with your thought process. So let's look at some of these. How, how old is the earth? Well, we're really, as we've said before, we're really not sure and nobody knows and the evidence that I've been showing and sharing with you all will date it somewhere between 7,000 years and 35,000 you say well no, I should be more precise than that no using scientific measurements the scientific method we can't come up with a date any younger than 7,000 or any older than 35,000 and the reason we can't is because things have not been uniform in the past now, one of the basic tenets of evolution is uniformitarianism, that everything has uniform. At the rate of wind erosion today is the same it's ever been. The light type formation, same it's ever been. Wave erosion on rock cliffs, the same it's ever been. The building up of rock cliffs from new deposits coming from lava flow from the uh, great crest in the ocean bottoms of the oceans and things of that nature is the same rate today it's always been. And so the earth has always been building at a constant uniform rate. Therefore, we can date the Grand Canyon by looking at the erosion rate of the Colorado River through the Kebab Plateau. Well, that all sounds real good and scientific, except it's not scientific. And we'll talk about that. So, impossible to be millions or billions of years of age. And one of the reasons it's impossible to be that old is for the simple fact that uh, some way or another you've got to come up with getting uh, nothing to something and the non living to the living and you have to have a very complex system while using a very simple system to get there from here and uh, so let's look just for a moment at uh, the basis of evolution and the basis of evolution here of course is that you started with a primitive earth and it cooled off and went to gases and then energy captured. Remember we talked before, where did this energy come from? Again, this is trying to create something from nothing, to create energy that was not available in the first place. We talked a little bit about the hydrogen cloud implosion theory, which violates first uh, law of thermodynamics and now even violates the second law of thermodynamics. Small organic molecules went to polymerization, macromolecules with the plasma membrane. Can you believe that? A plasma membrane is what you need to bound a cell to have a living cell. So they're, they're saying that this is a process of evolving the cell and suddenly you get a protocell which is a cell not living and then some way or another you get the living from the non-living. So you get, you get something from nothing and you get the living from the non-living. And then you go on to get photosynthesis and aerobic respiration. We'll talk about photosynthesis a little later. That's the exact balance between the green things on earth 
which absorb carbon dioxide and make oxygen, and us living uh, animals and plants and uh, human beings that take in oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. Well, which evolved first? Did we evolve simultaneously both processes for photosynthesis? In other words, did we evolve uh, respiration and photosynthesis parallel together? Well, again, the odds on that are astronomical that you could evolve these two very complex systems at the same time in the same place to come into existence because you certainly can't have them evolving everywhere at the same time. See? And so then, of course, from this system, the theory is, of course, that uh, what you have here is that you had the none living down here. You had nothing. You got something. Then from the something, you had the none living, and you got the living, which was a one-cell living organism without a, nu without a nuclear membrane. In other words, its genetic material was just random throughout the cell. And then this uh, one cell without a nuclear membrane evolved into one cells with nuclear membranes. And then from there, it evolved into three major forms of the fungi, which are not sure if they're plants or animals, and the animals, which include man uh, in this scheme, and plants, which are flowering plants and non-flowering plants. And all this is supposed to have come from this first one cell that evolved from the non-living, the something which evolved from the nothing. And not only that, if you didn't have any existence in the first place, where, how can you put something into nothing? How, how can you evolve hydrogen atoms and put them into nothing? If you didn't have anything to begin with, and suddenly you uh, just spontaneously, somewhere from somewhere, without any master designer or creator, you suddenly had all these hydrogen atoms, and they now occupy space, you have spa space and matter. And see, you're, you're putting something that you didn't have into something you didn't have. I mean, that sounds crazy to an English teacher, but that's the only way I can express it. Now, the process to doing this has been this for, oh, lands, ever since Darwin and the people talked. This is gradualism. This is the evolution that we were taught, uh, where you started with a single line here, and you went up and you got divergence over hundreds of millions of years and you got divergence, you kept getting divergence and in here, to go from here to there these are the missing links. Notice what it says down here. It says specialization occurs gradually and stasis is apparent rather than real. In other words, it, you have to sort of think about this. It's just sort of, you have to sort of uh, philosophically think it out, that this is what's bound to have occurred. We have no evidence of it, but that's what's bound to occur, is that uh, you had this one single line here of the one cell living organisms, and suddenly you had multicellular living organisms. And it just bound to have occurred, but it didn't leave any evidence. Transitional, form, transitional links should be found. Well, they've been looking for 200 years and haven't found any of them yet. And I'm going to show you some newspaper articles in a minute where they just keep on manipulating the evidence. Uh, and uh, here, an ancestral species can be transformed into a new species. Who says they can? Just because it's written here in printing, it's in a book, does that mean it can occur? It's never been observed. They can never do research to prove this or anything. There's never been one piece of evidence for this. There's no missing links ever been found. Every missing link they purport has now been destroyed all the way from the Piltdown Man to the Java Man to the Peking Man, the Africanicus, the Australopithecus, all of those are vanishing. And the Piltdown Man was a pure hoax. Neanderthal and Cro-Magnum are actually Homo sapiens. And Homo sapiens is the way we're classified. Now remember, that one's a very slow process, but no, all the missing links are still missing. Now this one here is called punctuated equilibrium. They've gotten in so much trouble with this uh, gradualism thing, now they said, well in essence, here's what happens. Here's my straight line again. And you see, actually, in creationism, you have these straight lines. But you have no connection links. You have all these different kinds. But here they've come up with punctuated equilibrium. And so it comes up here, and when you need a new organism, you just suddenly evolve it very quickly and do it so rapidly it does not leave any evidence. And that's very convenient. This is like a snake lays an egg and a bird hatches out of it, so now you have snakes and you have birds. See, in a creation count, you have snakes, you have birds, you have this, you have that, the fishes, and all that. And they're all straight lines. Straight lines from here, present time, all the way back to the time they're created. So you see, 
the evolutionists are now seeing that there are kinds, but they're proposing, since they cannot find missing links, they're proposing now that this is an accelerated evolution. Here, all these many, many years, they've purported that evolution is a very slow, gradual process of transitory changes and all that over vast amounts of time. Now they come up with punctuated equilibrium. In other words, they can't even agree amongst themselves. Us Christians don't want to get in that condition. We don't want to get in the condition of some of us believing the Bible is literal and some of us believing the Bible is not literal. Speciation occurs rapidly and then a species experiences stasis. And there's very rapidly and then all of a sudden it's what it is. Transitional links will not necessarily be found. The other one said they should be found, right? On that theory, it should be found. This one says uh, they will not necessarily be found. And a subpopulation of the ancestral species becomes a new species. In other words, you get a new species from a different species. And then, of course, the end point of this, after they do all this consideration, the end point is that, hey, we get down here and we find we have these tree dwellers and uh, the tree dwellers go on to start evolving into different types. See, they come off of here. And here about uh, six million years ago, I guess it is, uh, we sort of, our line sort of diverged off of the ape line. Now, according to this, we're more akin to the African apes than we are the Asian apes. I thought y'all would like to know that, that the African apes are closer cousins to you than the uh, Asian apes. And here we are, the hominids. Man. They make no bones about the fact that man came from this line here. Tree dwellers. Tree dwellers, see. And that these go back 55, 66 millions of years ago. See, you need, you need vast amounts of time to get evolution to work. And this is a more detailed drawing of the top part of that chart where the uh, apes and human kinds uh, broke apart. And over here, they just went ahead with the apes. But over here, see, we got this Othriopithecus ramus, um, remittus, or what do they call it? And these are the different things they've been finding and naming in Africa. And over here, of course, they have Homo habilis, and then Homo erectus, and then Homo sapiens, which is us. Now, look what they base this on. Brain size. 1,360 cc's. 800, 1200 cc, 700 cc, 400 cc. So if they find any skull, 400 cc's, they put it back at this point. If they find a skull, 700 cc's, they put it right here. 800, 1200 cc's, they put it right here. And you have to have a 1350 cc skull to be Homo sapiens. Well, what's amazing is over in the country of India, there are plenty of people running around with 700 to 900 cc capacity skulls. Living, intelligent, nuclear physicist and uh, but they say those are anomalies see anything that doesn't fit the the, the theory is, is said to be an anomaly you can throw it out such as those gold chains found in coal lot lumps iron pots found in coal seams the corner of a stone building found in a coal seam human skeleton remains found in coal seams. Coal seams were formed 70 million years ago according to evolution. How does a gold chain get in coal that was made 70 million years ago? Either man was making gold chains 70 million years ago or coal's not that old. So, what do you do with it? Those are called anomalies. Anomalies. They shouldn't be, but they are. Well, why is it impossible as we discussed last week? for the earth to be uh, millions of years old. Magnetic field would have been too hot just uh, 100,000, 200,000 years ago. One million years ago, the magnetic field, if we came into existence with a magnetic field we had according to the half-life today of magne magnetic field, uh, the earth could not have formed. Cosmic spheres would have been too deep. That cosmic dust, the leftover so-called, from the hydrogen cloud implosion theory. They come in at four ten thousandths of an inch per year. Remember we discussed that? And if the Earth is just a million years old, the cosmic spheres would be a mile or two mile deep. Up on the moon, they have no atmosphere to burn them up when they come in. How deep did uh, Armstrong find them when he stepped out for his first step from mankind? They were four inches deep. That's 10,000 years worth of cosmic spheres. That means the moon is no older than 10,000 years at the most. 
and the comets are too big. We didn't discuss this one. Halley's Comet comes in about every 80 some years or something like that. A comet loses one seventh of its volume every time it goes around the sun. So in other words, when the comet comes in, it has a certain mass. When it comes back out around the sun, it's one seventh large, smaller than it was when it went around the sun. So that means each trip around the sun, it loses one seventh. It will be one seventh smaller than it was when it approached the sun. Well, if you take Halley's Comet at the size it is today, and you add one seventh to its mass, and if it can make a trip ever, say, 100 years, even though it comes about every 80 some years, if you just make it every 100 years, you figure out how many trips that is in a million years. Just one million years. If our Earth and Sun was just one million years old, Halley's Comet one million years ago would have been so large that it would have swept our Sun and all the planets right out of our, the system. It would have come in been so massively large, it would have been like a street sweeper. It had just cleaned house on us and moved us. Comets testify that this Earth had a specific beginning not too long ago. Do you know there was over 100 comets that were able to be seen by the human eye during the time of the Caesars and the Roman Empire? How many do you see each year now with your human eye? It's rare to see a comet. You know why? They've made their trips around the sun and, and they finally go down to not just, just vanish. You know, they're so small that you can't see them when they come back and they just break apart. And uh, so comets have certain periods. They're called long period comets and short period comets. And all the short period comets are just about gone. They've made all the trips they can around the sun. And stalactites, we talked about that. Uniform carrionism, form a stalactite about an inch long in a cave, takes thousands of years. Mammoth Cave, Cujo's Cave, Carlsbad Caverns, all of them testify that this earth is very, very old with these gigantic stalactites. Okay, that's fine. Uniform Uniformitarianism, but let's apply that uniform Uniformitarianism to the Lincoln Memorial and to our bridge over at Clear Creek. In the Lincoln Memorial, they have 26-inch stalactites hanging underneath in the basement. That means that that Lincoln Memorial is at least 26,000 years old, using the theory of uniform Uniformitarianism, using the theory of creationism. Bridge at Clear Creek, Average the leg tights growing underneath it are about four inches long. That means that bridge has been there 4,000 years. The uniformitarianism theory of evolution says it has to be. You can't have something that's supposed to be uniform here but not uniform there. It's not uniform if that's the case. It's not uniform. You can't have four inch the leg tights on a bridge, Clear Creek, and say, well, that's an anomaly. And then go down to Mammoth Cave and date a cavern in Mammoth Cave is being 400 million years old because of the size of the stalactites in it. See, that's not honest. That's not scientific. And it's not honest. Well, we, uh, we actually uh, talked about the scientific method a little bit, if you remember. Scientific method says you observe. Then you propose. And you come up with a hypothesis. Then you, you design an experiment with control groups to check out your hypothesis. You gather your data, you shake your data down and you formulate a theory. And then you present this to your peers and you publish and uh, they will try to repeat your experiment and you have to in very detail in your thesis or your dissertation or in your postdoctoral study report that you make or your tech journal or whatever, however how you report it. And at scientific meetings you report it and then they do the experiments to see if they can repeat it. And if they repeat your experiment and get the same thing you get, then when it gets to be accepted very widely, your theory will become a law. And uh, evolution cannot even get to first base. First place, you can't observe it. Second place, you can't propose an experiment to check it. Third place, you cannot do the experiments. Fourth place, you can't gather any data on it. And all you can do, you start right here with formulating. That's where evolution starts. They get an ideal and they formulate it and they try to take it from the formulation stage to the law stage without doing any of this up here. You say, oh, surely not. Oh, yes, they do. If you don't believe me, you just get in there and you study it for yourself. Don't take the word of your professors and all that. Now, what is the evidence here for this old age of the earth? Fossils. Primitive man, Neanderthal, 
has been determined to be Homo sapiens. Cro-Magnum has been determined to be Homo sapiens. Piltdown man has been determined to be a hoax. The jawbone of an ape filed down with a metal file to make the teeth look humanoid. Java man has been determined to be a Homo sapiens with advanced case of rickets in that uh, thigh bone they found. Peking man has been determined to be the skulls of monkeys. Nebraska man was a pig's tooth and the Africanicus series are all turning out to be apes, gibbons, and monkey bones. Now there's your evidence just in that one line, which is supposed to be one of the greatest lines of evidence, is the fossil remains of so-called uh, living ancestors. Now, this, we'll just put these up real quickly. You've already seen them. We've already done the mathematics. Cosmic spheres, 14,000 inch per year. How deep on the moon? If the moon is just two and a half million years old, the cosmic spheres would be 16 miles deep. That's what evolution said. That's what Vonner von Braun figured out when he was going to land that lander on the moon. And they put an unmanned lunar lander up there and they found that they couldn't even scrape it up. And then when Neil Armstrong landed, they found the cosmic spheres are four inches deep. If you divide four ten thousandths of an inch into four inches, you will come out with 10,000. That's all you can get, 10,000 years. The magnetic field which we talked about has a half-life of 28,000 years. Here we are today. That means 28,000 years from today which would be 30,000 A.D., it would be half as strong as it is today. 28,000 years after that, which would be 56 or 58,000 58, years, uh, 58,000 years A.D., uh, it'll be one half of what it was here. That's your half-life. It's constantly dropping in half. Well, you can go back the other way. If you go, if the Earth has been here for all these millions of years, then 26,000 B.C., our magnetic field has been twice as strong as it is today. And if you go back to 56, 54,000 years B.C., it would have been twice as strong as it was right here, which is twice as strong as it is today. Do you see what's happening? Your magnetic field is getting very, very powerful. And you don't have to get back but less than a million years ago, and life could not have come into being. In other words, life could not have come into being on this earth with its current magnetic field more than 900,000 years ago. Well, see, that would defeat uh, evolution right there. Evolution has to have millions and millions and billions of years. Currently, right now, because of Hubble telescope, they now jumped it up to uh, uh, 12 to 15 billion years as the age of our universe. And they're proposing they need a bigger budget so they get a bigger telescope so they can find out how much older we are. They're just adding these gigantic, fantastic amounts of time. And 1,600,000 years ago, with a magnetic field as strong as it was, the Earth could not have come into existence. And that's scientific. That's observable. The magnetic field is the most scientifically measured thing in science today. It is very precisely measured. Well, here's where we left off last week with Miller and Urey. 1953, a couple of Nobel Prize winners for creating life in the laboratory. They took a Bunsen burner, they heated up, and they had a mixture here, and they had put methane gas, and they'd put uh, ammonia, and they'd put water, and they'd put uh, helium, and uh, hydrogen rather, and they'd put it in here, and they could constantly add things, these gases. In other words, this was not a closed, not, this was not a closed system in the essence that they dealt with only what they had like earth would have been had it been primordial like this but they kept having to add things all the time and my first question would be where would they get all this added and they can get this from the volcanic action but where would they get all this new additional gases that's violating the first law of thermodynamics which says you only have so much mass and so much energy and you can convert mass to energy and energy to mass but you cannot destroy nor create any new mass or any new energy and then around the loop comes the vapors and then they, they applied electro, uh, electricity here to electrodes and you had an arc across here. And of course, they could have lightning. They said this simulated the lightning. This simulated the boiling, primordial, hot ocean. This, uh, this here was the, uh, the lightning in the atmosphere. But then what they neglect to tell people is that when they uh, put these electrodes through here and they have these gases coming through, they had to put a condenser jacket on this with ice water coming through. And I find it a little strange they're proposing this as a model for the primordial earth and it's boiling from volcanic action. The water is so hot the oceans are boiling, but somewhere there's ice water in that primordial system. And the ice water condenses 
and then when they get the condensation, they have a trap here, and they have to remove these tars that come from this because these tars will destroy any amino acid formation. So they removed these tars, and then they gathered out the amino acids, but not amino acids, but prototypes of amino acids. They see, everybody thought they formed amino acids. They did not form any complete amino acids. They were prototype of amino acids. But they had to manipulate this entire thing, and then it came out in the press. I wish that I had a copy of the newspaper back then. Headlines that tall. Life created in the laboratory. Miller and Urey went on to win Nobel Prizes for this work. And yet, even today, reputable scientists looking at this realize there's no way in the world that this could have occurred. Uh, this is strictly a theory, imagination, and they did an experiment to prove their theory. They did not do an experiment to gather the data and shake it down because had they done this experiment honestly, they'd have said, we can't add anything right here. We can't use ice water, and we can't take out the tars. And if you do that to this experiment, you don't get anything except just tars. And you run out of uh, system. In other words, it's, uh, it just will not work. Well, let's look at carbon dating. Carbon dating, this is supposed to be something magical, you know. See, the basis of carbon dating is as long as I'm alive, there's a certain amount of radioactive carbon out here in the atmosphere, and I'm breathing it in, I'm incorporating it in what I eat and all, and I incorporate it in my bones and in my body. And I incorporate a certain amount of C14. But then when I die, I no longer incorporate any more in my body, but what's in my body now starts bleeding out in accordance to the half-life of C14. The half-life of C14 is uh, 5,700 years. It's a little more precise, 5,730 or somewhere there. That means that if I were to die today, uh, 5,730 or 50 years, I got the precise figure somewhere here on it. From now, I should only have half as much carbon-14 in my bones as I have currently right now. Once I die, I have to be dead, see, for the carbon-14 to be going out because right now it's coming in and going out at a constant rate because of how much is in the environment. I'm incorporating a certain amount in my body, see, in accordance with being living and incorporated in well, that means I should be able to find a bone somewhere. I should simply just try to check to see what the half-life of what the concentration of carbon-14 is by according to the half-life, see how many half-lives it's gone through, how much it's disintegrated, and I can report how the uh, old this thing was when it died so I know when it lived. Well, see, C14, it's like putting water in at five gallons a minute into a container, and it's like four gallons a minute going out. And if the th container was emptied and I turned on both faucets at exactly the same time and I let them run for five minutes, how much fluid should I have in my container? Five gallons. In other words, if I'm putting five gallons in every minute, taking four gallons out every minute, how much am I accumulating a minute? One gallon. If I let it run for five minutes and shut off both faucets, how much water should I have in the container? Five gallons. Well, that's supposed to be a very accurate, precise thing. Let's just check and see here. Let's just run down this chart here to right here. Carbon-14. I don't have... Ah, uh, you can see it pretty good, can't you? Yes. Carbon-14. First place, there's a 15% error in carbon dating just in the last 50 years. Why? Does anybody know why there's a 15% error in carbon dating just in the last 50 years? What have we been setting off in the atmosphere starting about 1945? Nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are radioactive and they make gigantic amounts of C-14. In other words, they, they cause a distortion in the C-14. So you say, well, we can just, uh, we have that recorded in mankind and we can just adjust all of our carbon-14 by 15%. Well, where's our uniformitarianism? You say, well, we know this 15% difference because man has done that. Well, how about those natural occurring nuclear explosions that's gone off on Earth, like down in the, what's been called the Belgium Congo? What about that radiation thing that came in over Siberia in 1916, 1917 that flattened hundreds of thousands of miles and still to this day still has traces of radioactivity? And uh, how do we know that those things have not occurred in our past? How can we use uniformitarianism to measure this when we know it's not uniform? 
But you see, these are just anomalies. Nuclear explosions are anomalies. Uh, things coming in from space that are radioactive that hit in the form of a comet or a meteorite, that's an anomaly. The natural occurring uh, from uranium in, our, in our, our ground and everything, just going off in a natural occurring explosion, nuclear explosion is an anomaly. You say, can that really occur? Yeah. You know, Krakatoa, the island that was blown out of the, the uh, sea down in the South Seas over at uh, Java and uh, that area of Indonesia, and it just, it just totally destroyed it below the water line. And uh, documentation that was taken at that time, and you look back on it, people had radioactive burns. They died later from radioactive uh, fallout and the problems of being that close to the explosion. The fishermen uh, downwind from that received radioactive burns and fallout damage and all kinds of things. That was a natural occurring uh, volcanic explosion that went nuclear. It might interest you to know that Mount St. Helens had the side not blown off when it did, that thing was capped so well on the top, it blew out the side. Volcanoes usually don't blow out the side. That one was so firmly capped and the pressure was building. In fact, that heave was heaving. You could almost feel it heaving under your feet for a month before it blew. And they could actually measure it. I forget how far the heave was. When I get to Mount St. Helens, I'll, I'll tell you about that one. And this is all scientifically measured and everything on Mount St. Helens. But had Mount St. Helens not blown sideways when it did and stayed contained a little longer, it'd probably gone off into a natural occurring nuclear explosion. And that would have really gotten our attention, wouldn't it, out in the western part of our country. Well, we've discussed the magnetic field, we've discussed the cosmic spheres, we have not discussed helium flux. Helium comes from the crust of the earth. The flux rate is known since if we've been here millions of years, we should have tremendous amounts of helium in our atmosphere. Well, we measure the helium in our atmosphere. We come up with the fact we have 79% nitrogen in our atmosphere. We have about 20% oxygen. And that 1% that's left over is carbon dioxide and helium and hydrogen and argon and all those trace elements. In other words, helium is just like a point zero 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 something in our atmosphere. Well, if helium comes from the crust of the earth just naturally, just fluxes out, percolates out, then we should have tremendous amounts of helium in our atmosphere. We don't. We only have enough helium in our atmosphere to account for about 10,000 years, less than 10,000 years. In fact, it's down about 7,000 years. And the evidence is, in fact, that helium actually comes into our atmosphere, that we're attracting helium from space, and our gravitational pull actually pulls helium in from space. So rather than fluxing helium out in the atmosphere, that's why the evolutionists explain it, that, well, yeah, it's true, we should have lots and lots of helium, but helium is actually going out of our atmosphere. That is not true. Scientifically, you do the experiments, and you, you look at the evidence and everything, and you'll find that helium's coming from the crust of the Earth, and helium is not escaping into the uh, space. Otherwise, Helium is actually being attracted in from space. So we actually have more helium in our atmosphere that accounts for us. It looks like we're older than what we really are. And uh, it's just not uniform at all. Well, while we're right here, let's look at some of this carbon dating. Uh, coal that was said to be 300 million years old was carbon dated at 1,680 years. Gas that was said to be 50 to 135 million years old was carbon dated at 30,000 years. Saber-toothed tiger who's supposed to live a million years ago was carbon dated at 28,000 years. Now, here, what we're doing is using the, the evolutionist C14. In other words, we're using their theory here. We're not trying to prove how old these are. We're just using their theory of C14, and we're checking the dates out on some of these things. A freshly killed seal was dated at 1,300 years. It died 1,300 years ago. A living seashell was carbon dated over 2,000 years old. It had died 2,000 years ago and it was still living. And a living snail that had just died was uh, calculated to have died 27,000 years ago. That's carbon dating. You can take a bone, cut it in three pieces, send it to three different carbon dating labs, and you'll get three entirely different figures. You say, yeah, they're going to be plus or minus a thousand or four or five thousand years. No, I'm talking about in the range of hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Difference from three different carbon labs. There's no standardization. The only standardization they have is their own standardization for their own carbon dating at that particular school or place. 
comets. We talked about Halley's uh, trip each 80 years and, uh, and uh, 1 million years, I believe it is, it would have made 43,750,000 trips if the system, oh wait, here's 3.5 to 5 billion years old. In other words, that's the, that was the last figure we had right there, was that the Earth is about, the whole system is about 3.5 to 5 billion years old. Well, if that's when Halley's Comet came into being, it's when the universe was formed from Big Bang, then uh, Halley's would have made 43,750 no, 43,750,000 trips, and it would have been one million times larger than it is today. You take Halley's Comet, and you upsize it one million times, and it becomes the gigantic uh, vacuum cleaner that I was talking about that would have cleaned us out. Well, coal, think about this minute. We've been told that coal is formed from the remains of trees. That's true. But can you imagine, I don't know how many of y'all coal mining areas and all, but we have seams of coal. We have blue gem, and we have number three, and number four, number five, number seven, number nine, number 11, number 12 seams of coal, plus others. These are coal seams, and some of them on the same mountain. One mountain may have five, six, or seven seams of coal, and then there's seams of coal down even below the rivers. Well, I want to ask you, how... How much remains do you think it takes to make an inch of coal, of uh, residue of plants? It takes a, a massive several thousand feet deep of, of logs and trees to be compressed down into coal. How much uh, remains would it take to make a coal seam 48 inches thick? That's a pretty good seam of coal. It'd have to be miles and miles deep. I want to ask you a question. How do you get logs and trees miles and miles deep and still growing other trees and things to fall down to make it deeper and deeper because we some place in Montana and places we got coal seams that are like 25 and 50 feet thick. And not only that, how in this one mountain, in one mountain, in one mountain, how do you get these different layers of coal? You know what that means? That means that the ocean came in, the ocean came in and covered up all these uh, remains of trees and then silt formed on top of it and it pressed it down into coal seam and then the ocean went away and another forest grew and several miles deep of vegetation died and then the ocean moved in again and the sediments out of the ocean covered it up and it pressed it down. I mean, how else are you going to form seams of coal? Nice straight seams of coal like that. When we get down to the point of talking about the flood, I'll give you a a much better theory on how coal is made. And in fact, the people that study this are now looking at it in, in some detail. Well, we're going to talk about the Grand Canyon later. We talked about all these missing links here. Dinosaurs we're going to get to later. And uh, one thing we'll tell you about, the Japanese fishing boat in 1977 got a, caught a sea-going dinosaur, a Pleosaurus in its fishing nets. You probably haven't heard about that. And uh, in China, there was uh, uh, dinosaurs being kept chained in temples when Marco Polo was there. Uh, Alexander the Great observed the dinosaur chained in a, in a uh, temple that the local people worship. Uh, that was in uh, Afghanistan, I believe, or eastern Iran. And there was an Italian woodsman killed a dinosaur out in the woods in 1400 and something in Italy. And the Seagorn Pleosaurus was caught in 1977. Uh, there's been two or three other things out of the oceans have been caught. Mega mouth shark, they call him, and one called Salentra. And uh, these things were supposed to be uh, fossilized in links way back millions of years ago. And here fishermen were catching them off the south coast of South Africa. We're going to talk in more detail about those things as we get down to it. Mammoths, we're going to talk about how that uh, they've been found in Siberia, especially with uh, buttercups frozen in their mouth, their stomach gases are still in their stomachs and when they raise them up they find them actually standing on uh, vegetation and plants and things. How in the world do you get a mammoth preserve standing up, chewing on buttercups and the digestive juice is still in his stomach? You know, when we pass away, when our spirit passes out of our physical body, these digested juices and, and all these things in our body starts breaking our body down very quickly when we get into a process of decay. 
Why aren't these guys not decayed? We said, well, they find them frozen in ice. Well, wait a minute. They're grazing on buttercups. How do they get frozen in ice if they're grazing on buttercups? I mean, how quick a weather change is that? That's an instantaneous change in weather. That is what's called snap freezing. And in fact, they found evidence of this in a man that they found between um, Italy and Austria a few years ago, and they called him the Ice Man. And what happened is the, the uh, glaciers and things had been melting back, and this body popped out, and they thought it was probably a mountain climber that had been uh, finally popped out of the glaciers, because this will happen. Sometimes they find bodies 20, 30, 40 years later. But the bodies they find look like soap, and they're real slick looking, everything like that. This, this one was totally desiccated. It was brown looking and uh, had a tattoo on him. He had nice teeth. He was carrying a bronze axe. He had a bow and arrows. He had shoe sandals on his feet. And yet here he is frozen in ice. You know, he had a cap. He had a cape. Uh, he looked like a civilized man. And I want to talk to you about the ice man later on because the ice man now has been filed away as an anomaly because they found that, uh, that copper axe with him. And uh, the first program they put out on the, whichever channel it was put it out, it was a two-hour presentation, reported all, it was scientifically done. It gave all the observations. They've waited two or three years now and they put out a remake. It's one hour long and they exempted everything out that goes against evolution. Everything. And uh, what they're proposing to do is to change the dates of the Iron Age and the Copper Age, rather than change the man from observable evidence, they're proposing to change the actual dates. You know what this is like? This is like going out to a little bighorn, you know, custard slice stand, and we go out to the cemetery there, and they allow us to dig in a cemetery, and we dig up one of Custer's men. And uh, we dig up one of Custer's men buried there, and they had buried him and put his cape around him, and here we've got, we've uncovered his grave and we throw his cape back and laying right here underneath his arms is an Uzi submachine gun. Now that's what that ice man was like. It was like finding one of Custer's men, cavalry men, killed in that massacre out there. It'd be like digging one of them up and finding them having an Uzi submachine gun in the grave with them. It'd be a little hard to explain, wouldn't it? That's exactly what's going on with the ice man and we'll talk about it later. Deep sea probes, we'll talk about them, coming up with all kinds of things. Fossilization is evidence of sudden burial associated with water. The frozen mammoths up here is sudden change of climatic conditions with snap freezing sufficiently to freeze the mammoth standing on his own feet. You know some of those mammoths, when they find them, nearly all of them, the flesh is edible. That's how they found the first big one. It's in the museum at St. Petersburg, Russia. And I had to search around for a couple of trips until I found the museum. And I finally went in and I photographed that thing. And there he was, just like what I'd seen in, in my books before. And there his trunk was. They didn't even put him an artificial trunk back on. His trunk was eaten off and he still had the, the teeth mark of the dogs where the trunk was outside the ice and the dogs had eaten the trunk off. And uh, so it's still edible flesh when they find them. And... Uh, Lots of fossils, and we're going to talk about them. But here's the thing about it. With all these fossils we have, there's lots of 100% reptile fossils. There's lots of 100% mammoth fossils. But there's not a single fossil in between that say 99% reptile and 1% mammal, 98% reptile and 2% mammal, 50% reptile and 50% mammal, or 99% mammal and 1% reptile. See, if you have evolution going from reptiles to mammals, you should have transitionatory forms here. None have ever been found as transitional forms between any species. Not one. No matter what they propose, no matter what you read in the book, it, they're just not found. Starlight. They say, well, I got you here. If it takes five billion, five million light years for starlight to get from that star to the earth, that means we have to be here that long. No. Light is energy. It's photons. Light is energy. It exists. When God created the star, he, he created the light between the star and the earth exactly at the same time. So as soon as he created the star, the starlight shone on the earth. That's what it said. You read the creation account, he said he created the sun, moon, stars, lights at day, lights at night. And he did it on a certain day. He did it in that one day. So the starlight came from the star to the earth on that same day that he created them. That's no problem at all. Stalactites we've already talked about. Well, how old? Just a couple of the summaries. 
Helium flux says less than 10,000. Carbon-14 says less than 35,000. Cosmic sphere says around 10,000. Magnetic field says less than a million. Nickel content of the ocean, we didn't cover that one. It says 7,000. You know, meteorites are 70% nickel. Well, if we had these meteorites hitting on Earth for a million years, we should have a tremendous concentration of nickel out here. Well, they say, well, they wash down these little tiny things, microspheres, they wash down in the ocean. You go check the ocean, and you don't find the concentration of nickel that will support the Earth being any older in about 7,000 years. Quantum algebra. There's only a few people on Earth that have double doctorates in quantum algebra. And uh, there's maybe 10 on Earth, and seven of them live in Russia. They're really big on this, this type of thing. They have been trying to calculate the age of their Earth in Russia, believe it or not. And they're, they're, they're just coming up with astounding things. And they say that, that putting all the equations together and working them out, it says the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. So that's an interesting one to keep our eye on right there. Well, here's that process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, man breathes out CO2. So does all the other animals. The leaves take it in. They use it and process photosynthesis and they put out oxygen and all of us living organisms use the oxygen and we put out CO2 and one cannot exist without the other. The total system. Now where's the energy come to support uh, the manufacture? All food, all food processing, all food chains start right here in the leaves. That, the leaf is where all food originates, one way or the other. And this, this system of photosynthesis takes place on certain wavelengths of light from sunlight that activates this system to take water from the roots, CO2 from the air, and to make uh, carbohydrates, C6H12O6, and uh, then give a byproduct of oxygen off. And so this whole system has to be in balance. That's what's bothering all the environmentalists today, see, is they're afraid we're going to distort this balance. And again, like we discussed last week, if we truly believe in evolution, we shouldn't interfere with any survival of the fittest. If, if a man comes along and puts up a dam and all the snail darters die, that's evolution. Survival of the fittest. Man's going to survive and the snail darters not. But you see, they don't feel that way about it. They claim to be true evolutionists, but they interfere all the time with the natural order. Uh, they say, yeah, but man's getting in the way. No, no, man's not getting in the way. Man's superior right now. Survival of the fittest. We're not in the way. We're the, we're the fittest. We're the survivors. We're on top of this heap. And so what's wrong? with uh, killing out the weaker links in this thing. Well, see, I'm not, I don't believe in what I'm saying. I'm just saying I don't understand how you can be an evolutionist and be a true environment, environmentalist and protect everything against the, the pressures of the, of the environment. See, because evolution responds to the pressures of the environment. And, of course, you know how far you can take that. You can take that so far that it'll become your basic uh, philosophy of life and you'll become people like uh, Hitler and Stalin and Mazi Tung and all that. Evolution, let's start down here. Evolution is survival of the fittest. Creation is love your fellow man. Evolution, man is an animal. Creation, man is the image of God. We'll talk about that more. Evolution, you have no accountability except the man-made laws. And those are in control or in power make the laws. Well, it doesn't matter where you live or what man's in charge of the country or what, under creation you're accountable to God. Over here you have a limited life on earth, a physical life, and you're annihilated, you don't exist anymore, and your components of your body are recycled for other life forms. Over here we are eternal, God has made us eternal, we exist in a corrupted physical body, we're going to receive a glorified body, we are eternal. Here we're recycled, here we have a definite beginning and ending relative to uh, the material here of the creation in the earth, but us people are eternal. Uh, over here, uh, evolution violates the first, second laws of thermodynamics, Newton's laws of motion, and the gas laws, and so does creationism. They, they both violate laws. But here you have a creator, here you have random. Random chance, a purposeful designing creator. Here, vast amounts of time. Here, six days. Literal days. Incidentally, uh, the, uh, there was a couple of articles I want to share with you. I don't know if we get to them today or not, but we'll definitely get to them next week. Let's look at it again. The unknown, nothing to something, chaos, unorganized, 
organized into uh, no life to life, simple to complex, survival of the fittest, competitors, man and the insects, the two biggest competitors right now. You know a lot of evolutionists believe that the insects will win out eventually. In other words, why? Because they produce massive amounts of offspring. That's supposed to be the one that's most evolutionary successful, the one that puts out the most offsprings with the least amount of work, energy. Well, look at human beings. Why are we on top? We put out the fewest number of offsprings with a total largest amount of investment, and our offspring can't live. We can't just uh, uh, have a child and walk off and leave it. In other words, we can't be like a loggerhead turtle and lay the eggs on the beach and go off and leave them. Never, never go back about them again. See? And uh, so the future is the death of our star. I mean, they're predicting that our sun will burn out. That's the reason why we have a space program. We have a space program so we can try to find somewhere else to go to before our sun burns out. I don't know what you thought the space program is for, but the space program is in support of evolution and curiosity and adventure. But the first foremost thing is we need somewhere else to live. Because if we're going to be here a few million years, our star is going to burn out and life can't exist here. We need to have moved out and gone somewhere else in the universe and found, find a better star and another planet so we can live on it. Well, of course, right here, you know, we don't really compete. Our future, we have a harmony of a thousand years in the millennium. God's going to show us how it could have been. And then, of course, we're all going to enter into this eternity. Whereas here, it's predicting death of the star, implosion, maybe the whole thing recycling over again. Who knows who will evolve to be the, uh, the top dog in the next uh, creation. Well, here's our, one of our bottom line thought process. This is actually a tenet of evolution. Now, this is right in the textbooks, right in the biology book I use at Clear Creek. This statement's in there. If you think about it long enough, it's just bound to have occurred. Think about it. How's that scientific? Do you remember the scientific uh, method to observe, do experiments and all that? If you think about it long enough, it's just bound to have occurred. And that is actually in the science book. Science books used to not be so uh, evolutionary centered. Evolution was just a little section in the back, a theory. And then it, it grew to be a bigger chapter and it started coming close to the front of the book. And now it permeates every chapter of the book. And now it's permeated down as low as you want to get in uh, school systems or in books and things. Uh, let me, here's a, my little book of dinosaurs. Innocent little book we buy for our children, huh? Yeah. My first little book of dinosaurs. And it says here that in the very first page now, very first page, very first words in this little book for children, millions and millions of years ago before there, before there were lions or tigers or giant blue whales in the world and before there were any people, there were dinosaurs. Then why do we find dinosaur tracks and men tracks uh, fossilized together in the Paluxet River at Glen Rose, Texas, southwest, southwest of uh, Fort Worth. Why do we find that? Here's one on ants. You know, the world of ants. Nice little children's book. Do you know what your children are reading? Do you really? Do you know what you're buying for them? Oh, on prehistoric ants, which incidentally are exactly like the ants today. Why, why is the ants, if they're so successful, they didn't need to evolve, then why haven't they become the bosses of the earth? So you go to a picnic, you probably think they have. Nearly 100 million years ago, in the early part of the tertiary period, ants were already living on the earth. That's your children's book, see? And uh, so that's, that's what they're reading. Well, next week, what we want to do here is, uh, oh, Psalms 119.11 agrees with this statement, incidentally. It says, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. See, that's what the evolutionists do. They hide their truth of evolution in their heart that they may not sin against evolution. You're a creationist. You need to hide the word of God in your heart so that you will not sin against God. Psalms 119, 11. Now, next week, we're going to talk about evidence for a global flood. It's, there are some fascinating stories going on now about the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea and the wave marks on New Guinea and the continental shelf and all kinds of things. The Sphinx over in uh, Egypt, and we'll talk about them. But what I'd like to do right now, I want to just... Am I down two minutes yet there, Ray? Am I getting close? I just want to give you a little, little something here to show you sampling. 
out of the newspaper. You know the Presbyterians voted. I shouldn't use the word Presbyterians. A major denomination voted except gays in the clergy this week. Well, in the same paper, you know when you start, when you start changing the Bible as to what the Bible says, and the Bible says homosexuality is a sin abomination. But this was in the same paper. Uh, the same church, the high shout creation time frame. The first chapter in the Bible says God created the world in six days. But now they're trying to debate how long a day is the Presbyterians are. I mean, this is a big issue. And uh, here's one I got. Animals may be people too. Harvard is starting a course on how that, uh, like the ACLU can uh, defend animals. In other words, an animal been mistreated, uh, the ACLU will step in and they will sue you because you keep your dog chained in the backyard because animals are people. See, Pope says evolution is more than theory. Genetic study traces evolution to Africa. Now these are recent. Fossils of Tinal Giant unearthed. Uh, here's some of them that amazes me. The fossils of common ancestor of Neanderthal and modern man is found, saying that they're both the same. And then over here, scientist says humans are not Neanderthals. I mean, you know, they can't even agree. Over here it says the evidence that they're finding says early birds flew high and flew well. They didn't have to learn to fly. Hubble photo shows Mars climate different from Viking discover. Well, here, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars on Viking, and we got all this good information that we purported to be truth, and all of a sudden the Hubble photos, they say, oh no, Viking's wrong. Well, we were told Viking was right. Now we're being told it's wrong. Meteorite from Mars, this is one that gets me, these are going to be the last ones. Meteorite from Mars suggests life may have existed there. You heard about that, right? Geochemist cast doubts on Mars claim. Now this is over a process of about a year. Meteorite does not contain, from Mars, latest study says, does not contain fossils. Now they, they finally said it doesn't contain. Now here, here's Sunday, June 16th. Saturday, June 16th. When was that? 2001. When was that? Yesterday. Right here. Martian meteorite could boast knowledge of the planet. Life forms, you know. You can't get rid of them. You can't get rid of them. They just keep coming back with bad information and putting it in the newspaper. Well, next week, evidence for a global flood.